Welcome to Bible Mysteries. You're listening to Episode 80, The Dispensation of Grace, Part 3. What if there are secrets in the Bible the world doesn't want you to know? Are you ready to take the red pill? And now, here are your hosts, Scott and Zena. Hello and welcome once again to Bible Mysteries Podcast. I'm Scott Mitchell and Zena, the Warrior Princess, is not here this episode. Uh, unfortunately, our schedules didn't work out this time, but don't worry, she's going to be back. We are still the only show that asks the question, are you ready to take the red pill? And of course, we talk about the things in the Bible the world doesn't want you to know. This is going to be part three of our series of the Dispensation of Grace, and there's going to be a part four as well. Uh, I, I suspect we'll wrap it up there. So, Zena should be back shortly. She's involved in some training that she's doing right now, and our schedules just didn't jive up that well. So I apologize in advance that you have to just look at my mug and not her lovely face, but we're going to go ahead and continue and, and press on the best we can. So we've been talking about the dispensation of grace, and while this has been a 2,000-year um, insertion into the prophetic timetable of the Bible, particularly Daniel's 70 weeks. We haven't gotten to really discussing that in detail yet in this podcast, but we've done a series on Daniel's 70 weeks. So if you haven't yet heard that, or you feel like you need to go back and review that, feel free to do so, uh, because that might help you understand why this is relevant. Another reason why the dispensation of grace is relevant to discuss today is because if we are correct about the timing of things, and we believe that we might be, and with world events occurring as they're going on, um, we may be approaching the end of the dispensation of grace, which is going to be the beginning of the next phase of prophetic, of the timetable, the 70th week of Daniel, which may be just around the corner in, in, in years, and in, in short years at that. So, um, I hope this is relevant to you, and we just appreciate all of you that tune in and join us each time. So we're going to pick up where we left off, uh, the Dispensation of Grace, Part 3, and we were reading in Matthew chapter 10, and what we were learning is that Jesus Christ, in his earthly ministry, had a focus to the nation Israel at that time. And what he preached and what he offered them was a kingdom offering that was a national salvation program of Israel that had they received it, Israel would have gone right into being the restored nation and the, and the people of God. Now, they didn't, and we know historically the nation rejected Christ. There were many that believed on him, but the national audience was such that they rejected him as Messiah looking to see that the actual Messiah has yet to come. But when Jesus called the 12 disciples, and he names them in Matthew chapter 10, he says in verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So they were directed not to go to Gentiles, the rest of the world, those that were not Israeli or not Jewish, okay? And he says in verse 7, as you go preach and saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the message they had to preach was the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was a warning to Israel that you can have the kingdom if you will receive the king. And they subsequently rejected that king and the kingdom offer was withdrawn for a time. The kingdom did not then transfer to the Gentile world. And it's important to understand that this kingdom he's referring to is the kingdom of heaven. It's, it's Christ's literal rule on the earth for a thousand years, which will be instituted when he comes back. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom, and it began the moment Jesus Christ began preaching. But we enter that the moment we believe. And the method by which we believe or the gospel that is preached today or the correct gospel that should be preached today is that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised again. Believe on him to be saved. It has nothing to do with Israel's salvation or national uh, salvation program. Uh, that has been interrupted. And the ensuing time 
has been called by Paul, as we saw in our first beginning, the dispensation of grace, Paul the Apostle. Now, if we skip down to verse 23 of the same chapter, Matthew chapter 10, we read, but when they persecute you in this city, this is continuing the directive he gave them to go and preach the kingdom message. When they persecute you in this city, flee you into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. So Israel even then was a fairly small region. Today it's small. Um, it's not the size it will ultimately be when God restores it. It looks like it's going to go from the Euphrates River to the Nile River, uh, according to the prophecies. But right now, the modern state of Israel is still occupying close to the same area that it occupied in the time of Jesus. And it's not a large nation, not a large people. So, if Jesus Christ has not yet returned, and he said, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come, and he means returns. They didn't understand that at the time because the twelve didn't understand he would be rejected and crucified. Even when he explained it to them, they rebuked him and said, we're not going to let this happen to you. But it was necessary for the mystery of the dispensation of grace to occur. So even if they had gone on foot they would have reached all the cities of Israel by now. 2,000 years later, they couldn't have cut. You could have covered the entire region of, of Asia in 2,000 years in every city there. So they were told they would not have covered all the cities of Israel before the Lord returned. So clearly, they had no idea that the Lord was going to interrupt the timing of his return with a 2,000-year insertion of a mystery, the dispensation of grace. And that's what many, many Christians fail to realize. Not only does this passage in Matthew 10 point to that, the message was only to Israel, not to Gentiles. He told them specifically not to go to Gentiles because it was an Israeli message. And that they would have gone over the cities of Israel, wouldn't have even completed preaching in all the cities before the Lord had returned. That is indication that they expected his return, whatever that meant, to be very quick or short in time. And to prove that that is exactly what they were thinking, after Jesus Christ was crucified and he rose from the dead, they were amazed. They, they thought all hope had been lost when he died, but then they were grateful and joyous and happy when he rose from the dead. In Acts chapter 1, they all gathered, minus Judas, who killed himself. Uh, but they all gathered together, the 12 or the, the 11, I should say, the remaining apostles, and then the other disciples that believed, I think the total was about 120. And they met and Jesus taught them for 40 days. The resurrected Jesus Christ taught this small group of believers, this assembly, for 40 days pertaining to things of the kingdom of God. And he was no longer talking about the kingdom of heaven. And as a matter of fact, the kingdom of heaven is never mentioned again in the book of Acts and throughout the preaching of the 12. And not only so, but never again did they ever say the words, the kingdom of heaven was at hand, which they had taught for three and a half years, along with Jesus Christ and John the Baptist. So the term being at hand implies it's soon to be here. It's, it's right around the corner. Well, it wasn't. And what was not understood at that time and is still not understood today by various denominations is the interruption of that program with the dispensation of grace. So here's the proof that they believed it was going to be right around the corner. Verse 6 of Acts chapter 1 says, When they, the eleven apostles, therefore were come together, they asked of him, Jesus, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time Restore again the kingdom to Israel. Perfectly legitimate question to ask. They'd been preaching repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand for three and a half years. They thought all hope was lost when he died. Now he's alive and they're thinking, great, are you now going to restore the kingdom? That's what they meant. The kingdom was at hand. The restoration of Israel to be the head of the nations, the priesthood of God, no longer, longer under Roman oppression and rule by other empires. And look at the answer that Jesus gave them in verse 7. And he said unto them, it is not for you to know 
the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Now that speaks volumes. Not for you to know. Been preaching the kingdom of heaven is in hand for three and a half years. Now all of a sudden you're on a need to know basis and you don't need to know the times or the seasons which the father has put in his own hands, which tells me right away in the book of Acts, a transition is being foretold. A change in the program is being mentioned and will take effect shortly. Now that's not only said in verse eight, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So here he's already see, say, stating to them that their message is no longer going to be limited to Israel. So that's change number two, if you will, the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, what's interesting is it will turn out that the message will be repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand again in the future, but not for now. For now, they were to start in Jerusalem and then cover Judea, the southern region of Israel, and then Samaria, I could say the northern region of Israel, all the way up to in, in, you know, Galilee, where Jesus is from, and then ultimately the uttermost part of the earth. And many believing Christians today think that that began right then and there, and they went with that same message to the rest of the world. But it didn't happen that way. They were still believing and expecting that they were going to preach to Israel in the uttermost parts of the earth, scattered abroad, because the, the Jews had been scattered abroad in prior centuries, and they came from every nation under heaven. They still do. The Jewish people live in any country in the world today, not just Israel. This was the plan. And yet, remember, he said, you shall not have reached all the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. So clearly in their minds, if you put this all together, they're thinking, okay, we don't know when the kingdom is going to be restored, but he already told us we're not going to cover the cities of Israel till he returns. So it's probably going to be shortly. I would imagine, and I'm just guessing, in their minds, they were thinking seven years because that's how long the 70th week of Daniel will be. And they had no idea when that week would begin the countdown of the seven years of tribulation. But as they began to be persecuted almost immediately, it is very reasonable to assume they expected that the countdown began right then in their lifetime. Seven years then came and went. And before you know it, no Jesus, no return. And the uttermost part of the earth commandment there in their mind would have been, yeah, we're going to reach all the world when we become the people of God again, the, the nation uh, uh, above all the nations uh, restored as a priesthood and everything else. They were ultimately going to go reach all the Gentiles, which is what the vast majority of the Old Testament scriptures says about that. Israel being the place from which the law of God goes forth to the Gentiles. So there's no inconsistency in scripture here whatsoever. If Christ had breathed on them to open their understanding, then their understanding would have matched the scriptures they had. We don't have a New Testament yet. So they had the prophets, and that's what would have governed their thinking. So by the time of the end of this first year of after Christ ascended up, which he does shortly thereafter in Acts chapter 1, and then they begin preaching, by the end of that year, a man is stoned whose name is Stephen. And we're going to come back and maybe visit that in, in, a, in part two of this. We'll see how it goes. Or part four, excuse me. But um, we're going to jump a little beyond that because it's after that Stephen is stoned that the man named Saul of Tarsus has a conversion experience. Saul was the enemy of Christianity at the time. He was a Pharisee, a very religious Jew, and he did not like the teachings of Jesus. He did not like the disciples who believed on Jesus, and he was doing everything in his power to stop that. He considered it a heresy, a, a heretical sect of Judaism, and he thought he was doing God a favor by arresting and even uh, imprisoning and, and killing 
believers in Jesus Christ. So in Acts chapter 9, verse 1, we read these words, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, the religious leader of Israel at the time, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Now, you've got to understand that Syria is way far north of Israel, uh, but there's a major city there, Damascus. And he knew that some of the disciples had uh, been scattered abroad from the persecution that arose in Jerusalem. And uh, there apparently was a large group at Damascus in Syria. And he wanted to have those people arrested and brought for trial. So he went to the high priest to get permission and letters to go out of his nation to arrest them. Verse 3. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? The Saul is asking, Who is this voice speaking to me? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he means that I've been pricking you, pricking your heart to get you to see the truth. And you keep kicking against it. You keep fighting, accepting the truth of this. And so at this point, you know, Saul may have had ultim any number of opportunities to believe, to hear the preaching of the 12 or the other disciples. And he rejected it. He hated it. So the Lord himself appears to him. Now it's a whole nother ballgame. Not just Christ sending an apostle or an emissary, but he appeared himself. That had never been done yet in the Christian faith so far. And so this enemy of God, Saul, suddenly comes face to face with God, and he knows it's the Lord, but he doesn't know his name. He thought he did. He thought it was Jehovah. But he says, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest, verse 5 uh, verse 6, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. So he told him to get up, go on into Damascus, and I'll give you further instructions, which he did. But what it's important for you to understand here is that Saul was trembling because he expected at that moment God was going to kill him. He'd been fighting against the Lord himself. He gets saved directly by the Lord. No apostle goes to him, and he meets him face to face in a, an encounter that had never been done before, like this. And now he's expecting to die, and God says, get up, go to the city. I've got some instructions for you. This Saul of Tarsus, the enemy of God, is the apostle Paul. God later changes his name from Saul, his Hebrew name, to Paul, his Greek or Gentile name. And the word Paul, Paulos in Greek, means to cease something. It's like a pause. Okay. Now, go with me to Acts chapter 10. Because in Acts chapter 10, it's kind of like the Bible's written in such a way that this chapter is, meanwhile, back at the ranch. Saul is out of Israel on his way to Damascus, and he encounters the Lord here. While that's taking place or contemporaneously with that event, Peter himself, who is the head of the church there as far as giving the keys to the kingdom, he was the one that Christ appointed and said, You're blessed, Simon Barjona, and thou art Peter. Upon this rock I'll build my church. The confession Peter made was in uh, Matthew 16. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So Peter gave him a special office, if you will. You have the keys. You've got the keys to the kingdom of heaven. What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and on and on. So Peter is now in a city called um, Joppa. And he had had traveled away from Jerusalem. He's still in the northern reaches of Israel, but he's uh, near the sea coast. And um, there's another man who is a Gentile centurion. 
and he lives in Caesarea, not too far from Joppa, but a good day's journey. And so we'll pick up in chapter 10, verse 1, because we're about to see another incredible transition. I'm going to read the entire story because it's important to see. So Acts 10, verse 1 says, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people. And prayed to God always. Now, in this first two verses, we learn something about this man. His name is Cornelius. He's a centurion. He's an Italian, a Roman. So he's not Jewish. Everything about him screams Gentile, and it's true. He is a Gentile. But he fears God. So somewhere in his lifetime, he learned about the God of Jacob, the God of uh, Isaac and of Abraham. And he believed on him and he worships him and he prays to him. And he even gives tithes or alms to Israel. He supports that nation, believing evidently that the people of God would someday rise up and be restored to their kingdom. All makes sense. Verse three, he saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming to him, coming into him. And saying unto him, Cornelius, and when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Now here's an angel appearing to Cornelius. Why would an angel need to go and appear to Cornelius? If it was meant to be that the twelve were supposed to go to Gentiles from the very beginning with no questions asked, why not just send Peter? or John, or any of the other disciples. By the way, he didn't send an even an angel to reach Saul. He came down himself. So something about all this is throwing up red flags of, there's a change here. Look at this. It's the Bible saying, notice this. This is important. This is interesting. This is uh, worthy of your attention. So here's an angel, not a man who comes to Cornelius and he says, we've been hearing your prayers and verse five. Now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. And uh, he lodges with one Simon, a tanner whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Now it's interesting because the angel appears to Cornelius and he doesn't give him the message like Christ did to Paul. He says, go to find this guy named Peter in Joppa, and he'll tell you what to do. And he tells Cornelius this information to send for Peter before Peter even knows he's supposed to go talk to him. And what we're about to see happen to Peter is that God has to give him a vision to show him that it is okay for him to go to Cornelius. Otherwise, he never would have gone. Because he was told from the beginning and preached for three and a half years, go not in the way of the Gentiles. And Cornelius is a Gentile. So it gets interesting. Let's watch. Verse 7. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. So I don't know who his servants may have been, but I would imagine his uh, devout soldier was also a Roman uh, or at least a Gentile. I would expect the servants were Gentiles too. So he sends three men to seek Peter in Joppa. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. On the morrow, the next day, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. So we need to get the the scenario here. They're on their journey to Joppa from Caesarea, the three Gentile men, we assume. Peter is in Joppa, and it's about noon. 6 a.m. generally began the day as the first hour, so the sixth hour would be 12 o'clock. And he goes up to the housetop to pray in Joppa. And he became very hungry, verse 10. And would have eaten, but while they made ready, they're preparing lunch, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened in the trance and a certain vessel descending unto him 
as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth. It didn't say it was a sheet, but the vision looked like something that seems to appears to be a vessel of some kind. Isn't that interesting? It makes me wonder if it's not some form of a spacecraft, a, a, a UFO, if you will, but from God. Verse 12, what's in this vessel wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air, almost like the ark in a sense. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. So he could see inside the vessel, whether it was like when he knit the sheet, if he says it was like a great sheet knit at the four corners, you can imagine the taking a handkerchief, if you will, and fill it with um, something, flour, whatever, to, to give it a rounded shape at the bottom. And then if you grabbed it and gathered it at the top, it would be pointed upward, almost like a teardrop shape. And yet the knit at the corner would mean there would be openings where the handkerchief isn't held at the top. And perhaps maybe those were portals or like windows where Peter could see in. It's very possible this was a UFO craft of some kind. And the voice said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. In other words, hey, are you hungry? Here's lunch. Here are some animals you can eat. Verse 14, but Peter said, not so, Lord. So he knows it's the Lord speaking to him. Not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And therefore, these animals in the vessel are not clean animals according to Jewish dietary laws. Now, it doesn't matter what Peter has been taught by Jesus about the New Testament yet. It's still his tradition to have followed the Jewish dietary laws of the Levites. So he says, I've never eaten anything common or unclean, no, no non-kosher uh, food. Verse 15, And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. It's interesting to note that God is telling Peter it's okay to eat these unclean animals when in fact he's trying to teach him something about men because he's about to be called by Cornelius' servants to go preach to him and he doesn't understand why he would go do that if they're Gentiles, which to the Hebrew was goyim, and it means like cattle, less than cattle, unclean, heathen, right? And so uh, interesting that God chose animals, unclean animals, to teach the lesson to Peter. Hey, if I'll cleanse animals, think of how I can cleanse human beings. So this was done thrice or three times, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. And, you know, so many years I've read that passage thinking, oh, it's like a big, a big blanket, but it said it was a vessel. It's the shape of some form of a traveling vessel. Verse 17. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision, vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, was lodged there. So the servants from Cornelius arrive at the house of Simon the Tanner, and they're asking, is there a Peter here? While Peter thought on the vision, the spirit said unto him, behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Well, now, no matter what Peter thinks or doesn't understand, he's been commanded by the Lord to go with these men and follow them. Verse 21. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom you seek. What is the cause wherefore you are come? And he might have also been worried that they could have been Roman soldiers that were coming to persecute him. He, uh, he's going to have to run for his life in a little bit later in Acts chapter 12. So they said, verse 22, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of good report among all the nation of the Jews. Notice how they qualify him to Peter. Hey, he's not just your average, ordinary, double dirty dog Gentile. <laughs> he's a good man. He fears God. He's just. 
and he is of good report among the Jews. The Jews know who he is, and they know he's a good guy. He was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words of thee. Now, the only words that Peter knows has been the message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, Christ trained them for 40 days after he rose from the dead about the kingdom of God. And I imagine he's processing all this and trying to figure it out. He's preached several messages, Peter has, in Acts 2 and 3 uh, and other places in the book before this, where he preached only to Jews. And he was teaching them, you crucified the Holy One and repent and be baptized. And everything about his message was Israeli centric. So now he's being sent to a Gentile. So he called them in and lodged them, verse 23. In other words, they spent the night and on the morrow, Peter went away with them. And certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. So not only does Peter follow the three servants, but some men go with him. Doesn't say how many, but it's their brethren, so they're also disciples. Verse 24, and the morrow after, by the time of the next day, they entered into Caesarea. And Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. You know, an angel doesn't appear to a man every day. So this is exciting news for Cornelius. So I imagine he had those couple, three days there to get as many family members and kinsmen as he could to come into his house and say, you are not going to believe this. There's a man coming to tell us great news. And here he comes. It's Peter. Verse 25. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshiped him. Because, hey, the angel said, there's a man that's going to be coming to you. But Peter took him up saying, stand up. I myself also as a man. Hey, don't worship me. I'm just a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. So imagine a Jew walking into a house filled with Gentiles. That was unheard of. And it was unexpected to say the least for Peter. Verse 28, and he said unto them, now watch these words. You know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew, Peter, to keep company or come unto one of another nation, this house full of Gentiles. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Well, when did God show Peter that? When Jesus was alive teaching him? No. No. After he rose from the dead during the 40 days, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, not then either. He showed him in the vision he had at Joppa with the great vessel that came down. That's the first time Peter ever learned that Gentiles were acceptable to God. Verse 29, now watch this. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying, because God showed me not to call you common. As soon as I was sent for, I ask, therefore, for what intent you have sent for me. And that question tells you everything you need to know about the so-called Great Commission. Most of Christianity believes Matthew 28 was Jesus telling the 12, it's now okay to go to Gentiles. Not true. They will do that. The nation Israel will actually do that in the millennial reign of Christ during the kingdom of heaven. But if that were the case and Peter understood it, then why ask this question? Why would he say to this group of Gentiles, why did you send for me? If the great commission was understood as they teach it today, Peter should have been the first one to know. Well, because you're going to preach the gospel to them. He didn't know that or he wouldn't have asked the question. And as it turns out, he preaches to them Finally, because he goes, I guess God has uh, called all men to repentance. And before he even finishes telling them the gospel that he preached to the Jews, the Holy Spirit falls on them and they begin to speak in tongues. And this before they were ever baptized or any hands were laid on them, indicating something changed, something big, something major. Now, if you don't think that's enough to prove this, Go to chapter 11. 
And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea, verse 1, heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. This was news to Judea. Remember, there was an entire church there at Jerusalem. And when word got back to them that a bunch of Gentiles in Caesarea got saved, they called for Peter. What is going on here? Verse 2. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised and did eat with them. They scolded him for doing this. They thought what he did was contrary to the law. But he goes on to explain the whole story. He told him what happened. He told him from the beginning how the angel appeared to him or to Cornelius and the vision appeared to Peter and Joppa and he was told to go. And then he explained how they all began to preach and speak in other tongues, which was clear evidence of the spirit of God descending upon the Gentiles. So when we come down to verse 18, it says, when they heard these things, the Jews that were fussing at him, they held their peace and glorified God saying, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Folks, this was unheard of. This was a new thing. I'm trying to get you to think outside the box. It's not the traditional Christianity that you're used to hearing because they never discuss this. They don't want to talk about this. They want it to be as though it's one continuous message that was never interrupted and we need to preach what the 12 preached. Not so. Because remember I told you this was meanwhile back at the ranch? All this is happening at the same time that Saul of Tarsus meets the Lord on the road to Damascus. And he's called out to be a special chosen vessel or emissary for the Lord. Peter was literally unlocking the door to the Gentiles because he was given the keys. And Paul will take that door and those keys and he's going to run with it. And he's the one called the apostle of the Gentiles. Paul is the one who went to all men, Jew and Gentile, with his message. And his message was not national Israel. It was salvation to all men. Look with me in chapter 13, jumping ahead. Saul eventually um, settles in Antioch of uh, Syria. Okay. And a church is established there. As a matter of fact, they were false, first called Christians in Antioch, just so you'll know. Not Israel, but Antioch. Verse 1. Now, there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. These must have been well-renowned men in the church there. And Saul was one of them. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Now, most of these believers here at Antioch are probably still Jews. I would imagine some Gentiles are starting to get sprinkled in here because we know Cornelius and his household believed and got saved. So word would begin to spread about that. So I'm not saying it was exclusively Jewish, but they're being separated unto a special work. Verse three. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost departed Barnabas and Saul. They departed unto Seleucia, which is on the seacoast in Syria or the northern region there. And from thence they sailed to Cyprus, the island off the coast uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. And when they were at Salamis of Cyprus, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also John to their minister. And this John is not the Apostle John. It's a man named John Mark, who I believe was probably the son of Barnabas. And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, another city in Cyprus. They found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. Now, it's interesting. 
they arrive at Salamis on the southeastern coast, if you will, of Cyprus, I believe. And they preach only to the synagogues of the Jews. It's Paul, Saul, and Barnabas, and John Mark. And then they travel and they come to Paphos. And there they are preaching. I, I would imagine they had planned to preach to the synagogue, and that's probably why they went to that city, because there was a synagogue. But there's a certain Jew there, and he's a false prophet. So he's a bad guy. He's a sorcerer, so he's somehow aligned with Satan. And uh, his name is Bar-Jesus. There's another man there whose name screams out Roman, Sergius Paulus. He's the deputy of the country. Most of the officials would have been Roman people and because it's the Roman Empire. And he desired to hear the word of God. So he calls for an audience with Paul or Saul and Barnabas. But Elimas, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation. That's Bar-Jesus, the Jew. He's also called Elimas. And it says he withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. So we have a false Jew trying to prevent a Gentile man from hearing the truth of the word of God from Saul and Barnabas. And we have a picture and type. We have a microcosm of something going on here. Watch. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, and from this point forward, God refers to him as Paul in the Bible. They filled, he was filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. Now this is Paul, Saul, talking to Elimas the sorcerer. And he said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, he's satanic, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? <clears throat> and now... Behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, Sergius Paulus, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord." You know what just happened here? In type, God just showed us the blinding of Israel who remains in unbelief, not the Jewish believers, but the apostate nation that rejected Christ. They are blinded for a season, not seeing the sun, and a Gentile gets saved. It's like God is saying from now on, we're going to start preaching to Gentiles, and the nation Israel is going to be blinded. And they did get blinded, and they've been blinded ever since. For nearly 2,000 years, the dispensation of the grace of God has been the light of truth to the Gentile world. And Jews can be saved too. But nationally speaking, the nation was blinded. Elimas represents the blinding of Israel, an apostate, satanic nation. I don't mean modern Israel today. I'm not discussing that. I'm talking about this Israel in the Bible that rejected Jesus rejected the preaching of the 12, and ultimately began persecuting them, starting with Saul, who God turns around and saves the chief persecutor and changes his name to Paul and gives him the ministry of going to the Gentile world with the message of grace, the dispensation of grace. Isn't that amazing? And so we're out of time today, but we're going to pick up right on this point where we left off next week, Lord willing, and we're going to dig deeper into how Peter and Paul were given separate ministries. It's not the same message that they preach. It's the same Christ, the same Lord, the same salvation, ultimately, but the programs were different, and the religious world conflates the two and mixes them together and to their detriment. If we don't understand the dispensation of grace and the timing of things, we're not going to understand what's going on in the world today, which is moving fast toward the setting up of the entering in of the Antichrist. If you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, I suggest you trust him now 
because there's very little time left. And I thank you for listening today. As always, we hope you'll share, like, and subscribe our podcast to our podcast, either from any podcast app or from the YouTube channel. We really want to boost that YouTube presence as much as possible. We know that giving this message out is ultimately probably going to get us removed from that platform because we're going to expose the Great Reset and what's really happening in the war in Ukraine and Russia and what's really about to start taking place with the World Economic Forum's Agenda 2030. You are being lied to on a massive scale, and we're going to do our best to speak the truth. Thanks again for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day. Till next week. Thank you for listening today. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to Bible Mysteries and share it with a friend. If you want to learn more, you can go to Unlock the Bible Now. That's utbnow.com. Hi, I'm Zena with Bible Mysteries. If you're enjoying the podcast and YouTube videos, please consider making a donation to support us. Your tax-deductible donations can be made through Unlock the Bible Now at utbnow.com. Thank you for your support.